Vanessa. Hello, Adam. Good evening, Tide. Welcome to Uncertain Things, the podcast. Today we have Matt Taibbi. Matt Taibbi, former writer for Rolling Stone, um, author of 10 books, one of which being Hate, Inc., which we talk about a lot in this conversation. And the author of the TK Sobstack newsletter. Yes. Which I highly, highly, highly recommend to people to follow. And the co-host of a podcast called Useful Idiots as well. He, he He's a prolific guy. <laughs> he does a lot. He's also like a dad of three or something. Like this, this guy doesn't sleep. I don't think. I assume, I ass- to be honest, that most of our listeners know who Matt Taibbi is. If if you don't, this will be a, I think, a, a great prelude. Yes. We primarily talk about his book Hate Inc. Yeah. Which is about one of our favorite themes: what's going on with the news media and why is it making people worse? The book, which I, I believe started on his Substack. Gives a funny but also thorough survey of the different mindsets that have taken over the media industry over the past 30, 40 years and how they play out differently on the left or mainstream media and on the right. So I should apologize that in the conversation, we ended up, I think, covering only the first two questions that Vanessa and I were planning to ask. <laughs> right. It's just because we got caught up in the flow. I do hope that he'll agree to join us again and maybe we'll get to ask question number three. But the other result of this is that we ended up focusing almost entirely on the scare quote mainstream media and didn't talk much about what's going on on the right because this is its own other morass and this is by no means to let right-wing media off the hook or to imply that what's happening on the left is more consequential although many friends that i have on right-wing media will claim that the cultural dominance of liberal institutions means that liberal media should be held to a higher standard and that its foibles deserve more scrutiny. I understand some of that argument, but I think it's largely an excuse to avoid looking at critically at your own home. But still, the fact is that those legacy institutions, liberal media, are the places that Matt Vanessa and I belong to and, and deeply care about, both as news consumers and as journalists. And despite what I said before, we do, at least I do, if I'm sincere, hold these institutions to a higher standard. But in the book, Matt does make sure to explicate the difference in media cultures, let alone political structures, between right and left ecosystems. So for a deeper exploration of those ideas, I certainly recommend checking his book or waiting for his next uh, guest appearance here. Yeah. No, I mean, like like you said, I think he, d- he does an excellent job in the book and in this conversation of explaining how these different business and cultural forces influence different uh, media landscapes and the psychology of of the journalists and the journalism culture. We really, got, we really like. I think in this conversation more than any other, we dug into what the culture is like for journalism, what it's like today versus what it was like 20, 30, 40 years ago. And I think that was super interesting. It's super interesting because it tells you a real story about the way that the information mongers of American society primarily have changed. And the schism we have in the first place, like why, how, exactly. it, how it divided in the first place. I think you, it, and that was a really interesting part of, of what he had to say, I think. I, I think you can, we can also have a footnote for, for people, maybe we'll put it in the show notes, to, to go back and I, match and compare this conversation with uh, the ones we had with Batyungar Sargon and uh, Nancy Rammelman, and maybe even um, the one we have with Katie Herzog, oh, 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 those many months ago. Media musings, yes. Interesting to see the different emphases that they each put in their analysis. Yeah, and, and I, I definitely would love to have him back, not just to talk about, keep talking about the themes that we explored, but also we, there was a lot of stuff we didn't ask him about, Adam, which was very, like you said, we had we only got to two questions on our list, but there a lot of it, like his background in Uzbekistan, doing like work in Russia, when, because we talk about the Soviet Union in the conversation, but we had, I, I didn't realize that that background, so we got to get him back to ask him about what it was like working there in the 90s. Yeah, I, I keep complaining about the navel gazing nature of, of journalists, <laughs> and then, then I bring a brilliant journalist to navel gaze, that's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> classic, classic. With that, I shall nudge you, dear listener, to subscribe to us on whatever platform you use. Although we have been using our Substack more 
as intended. We are uncertain.substack.com, but we have just created a new subsection called Inscrutable, where we post our rough, inchoate, impressionistic ideas based on our conversations, um, develop some of the ideas that we have in the podcast, and our preparations for the podcasts, and and just have a jumble of blogging. So if you want the writing in addition to the pod, go to your Uncertain Things account and just add Inscrutable, and we'll send you the newsletter. Other than that, any kind of support that you want to show us is, is obviously greatly welcome. And if you can spare a minute of your time, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts because that helps us reach more people and is just nice and warms our mm-hmm. hardened hearts. And with that... Matt Taini. Sarah, you're in the same apartment. Yeah. Yes, we are. We are walls apart. <laughs> that is... I've never heard of... That's the first time, I think, for... I mean, you should get like a, you know, like a 70s sitcom type set, you know what I mean? With a couch oh and everything. Gosh. An orange couch. <laughs> I'm imagining an orange couch. Thank you, Matt, for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Can you start us off with an elevator bio? I am a uh, reporter, uh, formerly of Rolling Stone, uh, now on Substack. Um, been an investigative journalist for, uh, and an op-ed writer for... I guess 30 years now. Um, I come from a family of journalists. My father was a television reporter, so I've been in the media business um, my whole life in, in, in a way. And uh, now mostly I, I write on Substack. That's most of what I do. Also, I also co-host a podcast myself uh, called Useful Idiots. Oh, I'm an author also. I've written 10 books. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it, 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 it ties in perfectly with what I was going to ask. Is that you have this, this, this something that always makes me incredibly ashamed of myself, this incredible stamina to actually write. Like, where, where yeah. do you draw it from? Mm-hmm. Is it just, just a... It, we, well, also, just for backstory, Matt, we started this podcast not as a podcast, but as a blog with the, you know, very optimistic thought that Adam and I were going to write, like, long form every week, and then that just never <laughs> panned out. <laughs> And, that's interesting and you, yeah and you and you seem to have the the the, the font to be right to be writing is it by weekly i think right because you write free posts and then your your subscriber posts all while writing your your books fiction and nonfiction. W- where is this energy coming from that is it, is it a condition uh that's a good question i i think it is i think most people who who are um actually it's funny i'll, I'll rewind and say that uh, when i was in college i had a pr- professor who sat me down and he, he turned out to be kind of a mentor. But one of the first things he said to me is, um, so you're going to be a writer when you grow up. It's, you just don't have a choice. Uh, like just some people are just wired that way. There, there's a, there's a, um, a type of person who gets bitten by the disease and uh, a radioactive author. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I, I think most, most people who um, are lifetime uh, authors will will talk about this that it's it just becomes the way you deal with the world and it's how you make sense of things and you can't live without it and I, I it, at this age I'm, I'm 51 now I, I still really enjoy writing so that's the best answer I can give I think most most <laughs> most writers it's not it's not a question of um you know stamina it's just that you you you'd just be doing it anyway <laughs> whether whether you right. want to or not I was curious when you were introducing yourself that you you did say that you're a reporter and you said that you come from a line of journalists. I'm curious, how do you feel about calling yourself a, a journalist these days? I've always had a very like weird relationship with that term because I don't feel like I am a legitimate journalist because I came up along the online websites. Yeah. Um, and therefore, I always doubt myself when I call myself a, a, a journalist. It just, I can't even say it without putting on a weird <laughs> accent. Um, so I'm curious what how you feel about that term. Does it feel comfortable on on you when you say like, yes, I'm a journalist. This is what I do. Uh, that's an interesting question. So, I mean, I I've done the most journalisty things that there there are to do right so uh, you know i've done long form 8000 word reported articles that have where every line has to be fact checked and you do original reporting i've broken news i've developed whistleblowers and th- done all that stuff so um i you know I, I i i can say without without it being a total lie i can say that i'm, I'm, I'm legitimately a reporter i guess i mean the, 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 in addition to that though i've done a lot of stuff that is more um, in line with 
kind of the new media economy, which is much more online, much more about creating content, you know, is, is less scripted. You know, I, I, I do a lot of that stuff and I really enjoy it. But I, I think that stuff still is journalism. Uh, journalism can be anything as long as it ref- reflects reality to a degree and, and, and um, tells people a little bit about the world in some way. Like, um, mm-hmm. so I, I think it has a very wide definition. And you still feel proud to, to call yourself one. Uh, proud is an odd word, especially these <laughs> days uh, where, you know, I think to, to quote Woody Allen, I think, I think journalists right now are like a notch below child molester in the public uh, public um, conception. Uh, but, you know, I, I was proud to be a journalist. I, I grew up around reporters my whole my whole life. I never wanted to be one, actually. Uh, but um, but I, I always admired uh, them quite a bit. It, mainly because of the culture, which mostly doesn't exist anymore, which was once very freewheeling, independent, um, dissenting, like it had this kind of comedy club vibe to newsrooms. I, I was So it was a subversive, individualistic, yeah. distrustful, exploratory culture. Yeah, exactly. All that stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I was, I, I, th- I thought all that the smell of cigarette and ink. Yeah, you know, that, you're, you're laughing, but that, that's, that stuff's all real. I, I, re, I remember what newsrooms were like back in the day when you could hear typewriters clacking and you never, everybody was smoking, um, even the people who weren't working, you know what I mean? Like, like uh, and, you know, journalists were, were a, um, a, a funny, uh, odd group of people. I, I, I remember I, I my first journalism job, I was an intern at the Village Voice. I was one of about 10,000 people to be an intern for this this, this uh, pretty famous investigative reporter named Wayne Barrett. And um, on my first day uh, in the office, I walked in and Wayne was asking me some questions about myself. And uh, I mentioned that I had been uh, a baseball player in high school and he said, oh, well, you're any good? And I, and I said, well, I was an all-star, actually, right? And I, I was sort of, you know, uh, very proud of myself in that moment. Well, about a week later, we had a Village Voice softball game. And I struck out in a softball game. And when, when, when that happens in front of 30 journalists uh, and you have a whole <laughs> summer in front, uh, in front of you, like I, oh, that's yeah. all I heard for the next two, two and a half months was like jokes <laughs> about striking out in softball and how hard it is to, to actually do that. So, um, and that, that's, that, that was the culture back then. It was, it was, it was very mocking, funny. Uh, and, and, and it was, it was, it was just a really interesting uh, time. It almost goes back to the the I mean a lot of the dialogue that you have right now about uh, I don't know if to call it inclusivity or concerns about offense seems to be the generational split between people who have the the nostalgia and I think I'm I'm certainly one of those to to the irreverence that belonged in the culture of journalism and people who saw this irreverence as exclusionary. Right. Yeah. No. I. I and and I can understand how that could happen because especially back in my father's day, uh, journalism was almost exclusively white and, um, and almost mm-hmm. all men. Now there's an interesting uh, difference in that it was also mo- much more working class back then. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, in the sixties right. and seventies journalists were much more likely to be like the sons and daughters of electricians or hmm. plumbers yeah. or whatever it was than you know, now it's almost all people from the Ivy leagues who are, you right. know, were, and, and, um, but you know, for a time, it was it was a whole bunch of white, wisecracking white guys, which obviously mm-hmm. I was attracted to for obvious reasons. But but um, you could see how it could be a tough environment for some people. However, I would say that uh, it it was pretty welcoming to any anybody who could do the job. You know, mm-hmm. uh, the the where it was where it got cruel was, was with people who were not good and who were perceived as like the company men. Or, or the company people, if there, if there was somebody who was maybe not good at the job, but did what the editors said all the time, like that kind of person did not do well in newsrooms, typically. Mm. You have chapters in your book in Hate, Inc. that we're going to delve into in a, in a minute, where you talk about, um, I think you call them the, the priests of mediocrity. And it's a phenomenon that we've described on this podcast in so many words, but 
which you describe effectively in your book, it seems that there are at least two different drives that push journalists away from focusing on good writing and the quality of their work. One of them is obviously clicks, which we talk a lot about, but the other is the, the reputational hazard. When journalists become too focused on the prestige of the institution that they work for, preserving their position within it can become the top priority more than say good writing. Right, exactly. Like, so, so now it is, there's, I think you'd find there's a kind of an epidemic of what you'd call credentialism, where it's a whole bunch of people who consider them, who are, who are very, very proud of whatever it says in their press past, right? Like I work for NBC or, or um, the New York Times, and that's where they draw their, their uh, identity from. And, you know, the, conversely, you can see in the way they write about somebody like Joe Rogan, like, even though he's got the biggest audience in media right now, he's seen as an interloper and, um, you know, a fraud, right? Because he didn't go, th- he didn't go through the right channels and doesn't have the right credentials. Uh, but once upon a time, um, I think, you know, personalities like Cy Hirsch, you would never have seen them, you know, a glow because they had the New York Times label they were, they were a glow because they were Cy Hirsch you know what I'm saying like that that's so there, there was a big difference in in um this whole idea of identifying with the institution versus you know identifying with the job with the job there's an Israeli phrase that I always had a, a bit of an issue with but it's better to be the tail of the lions than the head of the wolves in other words you're better off being the worst of the best than the best of the mm-hmm. worst mm-hmm. and I, I feel like In, in many ways, in the old journalism that, that we're, well, I guess, we're acting nostalgic about, I felt like it's almost better to be the head of the wolves than the tail of the lions. Mm. Being an, an intern at the New York Times today is more legitimizing than, say, being the sharpest writer in a slightly more obscure newsroom. Oh, yeah. No, right. Uh, Sorry if the, met, the, <laughs> no, no. the feral metaphor confused the conversation. <laughs> I, think, I think you're, you're, you're onto something. Like, there, were, there was a, probably a time when there was kind of a creed between reporters uh, that crossed over uh, and, and made the institutions less relevant. So if you were good at the job, uh, reporters sort of kibitz with each other. They talked constantly. They, they, they felt themselves to be a member of a club um, that was important. It didn't matter who was first so much. Like the, everybody was happy to kind of move the story forward a little bit. And so you could you could be you know somebody who worked at a small local paper and you could or you could be a front page writer for the New York Times and they would have respect for each other right if they if they were, were both doing the job well now I, I think what you're talking about is 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 uh, is true there's just a lot of the, that that kind of idea of well this is a legitimate person and this one isn't uh, it, it doesn't have so much to do with with the quality of the work it has to do with the identity of the institution and And the identity of the institution then bestows on you the authority to judge reality, mm-hmm. not the scruples or thoroughness of your journalism. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I've experienced directly sitting at big newsrooms that I work for. You could feel how just sitting there, just being there and overlooking usually Manhattan from the 20th floor inspired people with the feeling that their opinion carried more weight and all the institutional trappings and the setting and the sloganeering was geared towards that towards instilling us with this illusion of grandeur and importance making it seem that every snarky aside uttered whenever trump's face appeared on the tv screen right meant something was more meaningful and worthy than than just any random ass tweet yeah absolutely <laughs> and, I, I, and i think you 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 would find that um i found that that atmosphere to be thickest in like campaign journalism so mm. you know you'd have like three sets of tags on your lanyard you, you had your regular press pass uh you had your campaign press pass and then there was the um the secret service pass right so you were like triple credentialed you know and Anything that anything you said and you were behind the rope line with the candidate mattered more than what people outside the rope line said, you know, and I and I, I definitely noticed that that phenomenon of people, you know, starting to, to feel like they were, uh, you know, sort of like the elect, right? They were they were of, of a different uh, 
a different uh, quality than everybody else, um, which is not a great place for, for, for reporters to be like, you know, right. once, once you get that kind of high school headers vibe going, it's, it's not, not a good thing. And the contrast is that you feel that it becomes scary for those people to lose that position. Don't you think? Because your incentive becomes making sure that you keep your job in this institution or climbing to a more prestigious institution. But that fear of losing the elite status ends up informing a lot of people's work. And I mean, that connects also to the fact that opportunities to make money in journalism are, mm. are constantly decreasing. Right. Although, although I think a lot of people who are in legacy media are, are wrong about that. There's probably more mm. opportunities to make money outside uh, prestige mm. media now than there is inside. Um, but you're right. The, the people definitely fear losing the credential, among other things, because it's hard to get information from people if you're calling up and you have to explain right. yourself like that's difficult. So when you're saying that there's more opportunity outside of media, you think to to make money, are you referring to Substack? What are you, what are you referring to? Like, what is the what, how are the how is how are the models starting to shift? Well, I think Substack and podcasts, just as a proof of concept, show that there's a massive audience out there for, you know, for content that that is different from legacy media. I, I, I know that my subscriber base Whenever I hear people coming uh, to to my Substack, they, they will say things openly, like I'm coming. This is like a protest subscription. Like I'm I'm <laughs> I'm giving you the money that I would have given the New York Times, and there, hmm. there's a lot of that going on right now. Huh. Uh, no, you know the Times is doing great. They have the largest subscriber base in the world. I think it's like seven million, seven plus million people now. But there's a huge, huge market out there for something else, and it's it's an undefined landscape, and people and and a lot of a lot of consumers. So we're going to go into all of this in a second. I just there's a question that I was intending to be the first one, but obviously we're going to ask it halfway through. You describe yourself in the introduction, I think, to um, Hate Inc. as somebody who's you know, it's never been really motivated by either politics or by the sense of righteousness that sometimes typifies some of the articles that you see today, but by, and, and this is where I, I related, I think it was a taste for curiosity and absurdity and humor. Mm -hmm. Say more. I definitely have an absurdist uh, outlook on life. Um, when I was growing up, I had, I went through problems as a lot of adolescents do. And one of my ways for figuring uh, things out, I, I, developed a real passion for absurd novels like i there's a couple of russian writers who were who i was big fans of i read books like catch 22 and gulliver's travels evil and wild books like anything that made you laugh uh, and was satirical you know i really connected with and and i, I the sort of absurdist view of of how the world works, you know, is something that I carry with me, probably almost like a religion in a way. I mean, I, I've become more conscious of it lately. But one of the things that's interesting about that is that in terms of journalism, when I started to go into the business uh, for, for real, I, I noticed that I was attracted to the uh, some of the same themes that I was that, that I read about in all these novels. So like, for instance, when I first started writing serious articles about Russian corruption in the Yeltsin mm. administration in the 90s. You said Gogol. Yeah, it's it's straight out of Gogol or Kafka or any of that. So like it's just the, the preposterousness of these characters uh, and the, the, you know, the sheer sort of sociopathic greed, all that stuff. I was really turned on by a lot of those themes. Uh, and then just by curiosity, like how do, how do things work? How do people do this stuff? You know, if you're if you're going to steal a billion dollars from, you know, as a, an official in the Yeltsin government, like what what are the mechanics of that? Like how, how how do you do that? That's that's the kind of thing that I think ends up making a good journalist is being like sort of deeply curious about uh, mm -hmm. sort of the minutia. Yeah, that that's that's my <laughs> mentality when I cover a story. I, I find a lot a lot of things just sort of funny and and ridiculous. I think it. I think it helps in, in this in this environment because everybody's so attuned to this like left right narrative, which I, I think can be really unhelpful as a lens to try to understand things. It's just it 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 doesn't shine a, a whole lot of um, light on sort of broader themes of humanity. Uh, I would right. say. Yeah. It goes beyond the polarization, right? Because the the polarization, well, aside from being the 
like it, you put it perfectly it doesn't shed any light about humanity really because it's just you, you were talking about weird structures that are, are meant to be procedural proxies really things that have no business defining our identities or the things we value in the world but the public conversation has become three levels of abstractions where talking about politics is a proxy for a proxy of something that maybe at some level we do care about but that contributes to the feeling that nothing on twitter or in in the political conversation really means anything that everything is sort of fake and inhuman it often feels as if it has as much to do with our actual lives as arguing about marvel plot lines but this is now one of the key products that news provides and it goes beyond polarization I, i've mentioned uh the the righteousness but it's basically the offering of a constant supply of moral outrage and panic and zeal mm. and this comes at the expense of stories about things that have immediate effects on people or at the very least the sort of cool remove that would allow people to step back and say huh that's kind of weird right exactly isn't it, isn't it, isn't yeah. it weird yeah. and funny that Donald Trump is our president right now. Yeah, and how could how does that happen? How did that happen? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. No, and 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 you're absolutely right and and um it's funny you know when, when you talk about how irrelevant the, the the these structures are to anything, you know, real in our lives. I, I remember there's something Noam Chomsky wrote about how um about the 2000 election between Gore and Bush. And he said, you know, in a country as big as the United States, you couldn't possibly have a, a, a statistical tie in an election unless they were voting for something like the president of Mars. Right. Like, <laughs> in, in other words, unless it was about something so totally random and unconnected <laughs> to, to real life that that the distribution would would actually be mathematically random. You couldn't possibly get that result. Right. <laughs> and and I think there's there's a lot to that. Like, the you know, the the. Politics in, in, in the United States has become a thing that's so detached from anything that we actually um, feel in, in our real lives that um, it becomes something that's kind of random for a lot of people. Right. And, and, as, and as for the, the whole, like, uh, you know, responding to, to Donald Trump, uh, the, the phenomenon with, you know, sort of a shrug and like, wow, you know, like, that's actually the more natural reaction to for for a journalist is to be, is, is to be first, yes, a, a little bit shocked, but, uh, but the, the, the absolute next thought should be, well, I, I got to figure that out. Like, you know, <laughs> like, I, I didn't see that coming and, mm. and, and how, how could that possibly happen? And, and, and that was exactly what we didn't see a whole lot of in 2016. They, there was a whole lot of judgment. There were a whole lot of epithets. There were, there was a whole lot of, um, editorializing about how horrible it was, hmm. but there was very, very little of that kind of deep, soul-searching, investigative um, impulse. Like, you know, how did we get from here to there? Like, it's a pretty huge jump. Um, and they, they, well, there are reasons why they, why they jumped over that, but, but you know, it was, it was yeah. very conspicuously out. There was like a week. There was like a week of kind <laughs> right, of like yes, exactly. fl yeah. self-flagellation. And then it, it very quickly was forgotten and moved on from. That, that's right. It was, it was about that long. Yeah. It was the week in which the phrase economic anxiety was used unironically mm -hmm. before it became, <laughs> you know, half raised eyebrows, economic anxiety. You know what we're talking about, which by the way, I find still fascinating just how quickly that phrase has fallen from a call to action for the media to reckon with its elitist coverage and blind spots into becoming now a code word for racist voters. Yeah, I actually have a story about that because that was one of the first moments where I, I knew something. That, that was actually one of the pretexts for writing Hate Inc. Ah. Or not. Um, so in... I think the this, the last feature I wrote about the election in 2016. Um, remember, after the whole Access Hollywood scandal, there was a moment when Trump got disinvited from one of his own speeches. <laughs> uh, he was he was supposed to give a joint speech with like Paul Ryan and some other people in Wisconsin, and they they you know washed their hands of him and decided that he couldn't come. 
but I was there. I was, I was covering it anyway. And I interviewed somebody in the crowd who um, who had come from a family of Democrats, uh, union workers. Uh, and he just started talking about how um, we've never voted anyway, but Democratic, but we're kind of disillusioned because of NAFTA. And we're voting Trump, not because we like him, but because, you know, because we're just done with all these people. Right. And and all I did was quote the person like the, the piece itself is is extremely negative about Trump. It's also it was also uh, kind of blatantly incorrect because I thought his campaign was over at that point. Mm. Um, <laughs> but I, I quoted this guy and I got I got tons of flack not so much on social media, but from colleagues who were suddenly on my case about you're peddling economic anxiety. And that's like a racist trope. And I, it like, I didn't even understand what they were talking about at first, but it, it, it was, it was something that, you know, I think it became a substitute for explaining. It just became a way to, to keep journalists away from all the different explanations, you know, some of which included race, obviously, but, mm. but, yeah, there were other things going on. You know, maybe maybe you can help me. I've been struggling to find the right words to talk about this issue. Maybe because you are, uh, how do I say it in the least pathologizing way, a <laughs> prolific writer. Maybe you can help me nail the verbiage. I am loath to call this the problem of mainstream media because mainstream media, MSM, is loaded with so much Rush Limbaugh flavor mm -hmm. that I would like to avoid because... It's important in the extreme, in my view, to to draw these lines clearly, because we all might be criticizing similar institutions, but we're coming at this criticism from radically different perspectives and intuitions. But this problem, whatever we might end up calling it, is revealed perfectly in the discomfort that some journalists have with the term economic anxiety. Because this is an angle that should obviously be the or have been the focus of so much of the coverage of outlets that boast about their strong stance against growing economic inequality. How can you, if you claim that, miss this story of slipping American opportunity, not just miss it, dismiss it, and not only that, use it as a cudgel against the people who are genuinely worried about it and say that, first of all, you're worried about the wrong things, and second, if you are worried about it, then you're racist, or at a minimum, a bad, uninformed <laughs> person. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. And let me tell you what you should be worried about, and I'll call you racist if mm. you don't. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 it, it 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 can be kind of jarring. I mean, I think if I if I were younger when that happened, I would have been deeply freaked out. I, I was freaked out as it was by by that whole episode. It, it was it was the first of like many things that happened in the, in the last five years where suddenly there there was all this peer pressure um within the business to avoid certain themes and play up others and uh there would always be these shots kind of fired across your bow usually on twitter by from from colleagues if you if you sort of venture it outside the accepted area and this was a new thing like you know, you know in my early career at rolling stone um for instance i you know i wrote very positively about barack obama in 2008 in 2009, I wrote a lot of negative stuff about his response to the to the financial crisis, and the uh, response from colleagues was very positive. Like the, the the idea was, well, it's good that you're independent minded, that you're able to see things, you know, objectively, and and that that your political leanings don't impact your coverage. Suddenly, all that's out the window, and now and now we're in this new environment where. People are intensely interested in making sure that you, everybody says kind of the same thing and avoids and avoids other things. And as you say, you know, the economic anxiety things should should have been one of the biggest things we looked at. I mean, I understand the point that most of the people who voted for Donald Trump were not like poor in the traditional sense. But you could see this coming long before Trump, that there was this thing happening in the country where people were just. Um, every er, everything about living in America has gotten more difficult. Like wh whether it's you have to drive a hundred miles further to, to find a place to deliver your baby, or um, the copays are higher every year, or you know uh, it's it's harder and harder to find a school district where 
you can get your kids safely to school. Like all those things are just more difficult. And, um, and they contribute to people making very, very impassioned decisions in all directions. How can you ignore that? How can, how, how can you not think that that's a serious factor in, 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 in politics? I, it's just baffling to me. You know? And a key word, I think, is the anxiety. It's not, it's not the poverty in itself. It is, is, is this, the sense. It's this, this feeling that things are getting more crushing. And it's funny that there seems to be an intolerance to that narrative from, from our community of, of, of journalists and, and pe people from uh, Vanessa and I generation. We are older millennials and, and even younger people who, who constantly will peddle out stories about how difficult it is, how crushing to be a content maker in, in New York. <laughs> Yes, this is what you would call an economic anxiety. And I think, in fact, I, ironically, this connects to what I was saying before. I, I do think that a lot of the things that push the current state of bad journalism is the economic anxiety of content makers. I mean, you're, you're, I think you make a good point. Like, and they're clearly this, often like wealthy enough, sometimes even hmm. children of very wealthy parents, but they feel the economic anxiety and yeah. They, and they've got four roommates or whatever it is. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, um, and journalism is not a play. If you, if you go into it to make money, you, you made a bad decision anyway. <laughs> uh, and, and even if you do make money, it tends to be much later. Right. So yeah, if there's a lot lucky. of, un if you're, if you're lucky. Yep, absolutely. But yeah, no, if, if, uh, if you don't recognize that, yes, even though that's 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 uh, not a fun time in life to be cranking out content for no pay uh, and living, you know, with in a, in a fifth floor walk up um, with five roommates, you know, try try having three waitressing jobs and ra raising a single raising a kid on your own in like you know rural Iowa or something like that. Like you you start to meet people who are you wouldn't call them poor, but they're just maxed out. You know what I'm right. saying? Like there's a lot of people out there who are like, who don't have a whole lot of margin left in terms of how much patience they, they, they have. And if you, if you can't see that you're missing a big part of the picture. Yeah. It, it, it also connects to this idea. I think about the fact that you were just even just quoting this person and then getting pushed back for it. I think it does connect to this idea of like, who's the worthy and unworthy victim that mm -hmm. Adam and I were going to ask you about this later, but I guess I'll just insert it, I'll some sort it now since I think it connects. It's like, it's so odd that there seems to be like a closing of ranks on who we're allowed to, uh, I don't even want to use the word celebrate because that seems weird, but celebrate as a victim versus who is, who we're not allowed to celebrate as a victim. And it's, it's odd because there's, I mean, there's, there is like a human capacity, I guess, for ha like for stories. Like we can't cover everything. We can't cover every tragedy and every issue. So there obviously there has to be some kind of selection process, but it does seem that there's, there's some sort of weird like solidifying of the categories right now. And, and if you deviate from that, then it doesn't, it doesn't feel like an acceptable story somehow. And for just contextualizing, this is a phrase that you that you explore in your book that that that, right. that you in one of your references to um, um, Noam Chomsky's uh, manufacturing consent. And our listeners know that the Chomsky is my linguistic nemesis, so um, <laughs> I will make sure to insert the the the, the ominous theme dun, when dun, dun. he's mentioned. <laughs> yeah, um, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, the, the 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 worthy and unworthy victims idea with Chomsky originally was was a really interesting and perceptive one, which was that back in the day in the '70s and '80s, we it was unspoken, but everybody knew that it was okay to write about the misery of people in Poland and in uh, Czechoslovakia and um, you know in North Vietnam or wherever it was. Uh, but we didn't we didn't write about analogous stories in El Salvador or any other uh, or Iran or any other place where the, uh, America was. American imperialism left its mark. Yeah, exactly. Like our satellite uh, uh, countries were off off limits. Those were uh, not worthy victims. Uh, the people who were repressed by the Soviets, they were worthy victims. Right. Uh, and or, or however you want to cast it. We, under, we understand what he's saying is that you can cover the one thing, but you can't cover the other, even when it's an exactly analogous story, like, you know, the assassination, assassination of a Catholic priest by, 
local hit local death squads or something like that. Um, but now we've we've brought this to domestic politics in America. This phenomenon, this is of worthy and un- unworthy victims, and it's it, it's such a bizarre thing. First of all, the you know this whole idea of the white working class, which is another phrase that we heard kind of paired with that economic anxiety. It was like a new invention. Um, I, I hate the term for a whole lot of reasons, but one of them being like the working class isn't white, right? Like it, it you know, it's, it's multi- multiracial. And I think it was a way to um, kind of misdescribe uh, a segment of the, of the population, but broadly speaking, the kind of people who are, who the media calls the white working class are now off limits for um not just sympathy, but just even kind of normal diagnosis. Like you know, a, a journalist in some ways should be like doctors. Like we don't, you know, we, we don't care, uh, you know, what your history is. You come in, we tell you whether you have a fungal infection or not, or not, you know, like that's, that's our job. Like the rest of it is up to you. Um, and so when it comes to something like, you, you know, why did, why did this person vote for Donald Trump instead of, instead of Hillary Clinton, are, we're supposed to be dispassionate about that. Like, I don't, I don't care, you know, like why you made about that decision. My job is just to figure out why you did it and, and to help readers understand that phenomenon generally, like we're, we're just supposed to understand, like it's not supposed to be a matter about caring or not caring or approving or not approving. Suddenly all these, these this, there's this new thing about conferring approval uh, that you that you mentioned there that and that's just new we, 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 I, I've never seen it before um you know at least in a domestic politics and it's it's very strange it's interesting the first of all the the, the point about white working class is is really is really fun it's it's this phenomenon that has been happening in the past six years very clearly coding who it's okay to not care about or even to turn into a villain and it's very difficult to talk about because obviously we want journalism to be able to discuss very clearly when racial disparities come into play and have effect on either on decision making or on latent structural impact. And in all sorts of ways it is clearly part of the DNA of American society. So you want to be able to talk about it very clearly. But the way that it seem at least it seems to be used often in coverage is basically to change your permission structure. This thing that you normally would have empathy for, now you're allowed to not care about. You know how we just had the Me Too moment, care about women, but white women are the people that brought you Trump. So then you can hate, malign, and abuse online. Right, and then it might change again if the, if the issue was trans rights or whatever, right? And right, and, and it's, it's just so, so weird. It is, it's creepy to, to see this happening as, because you can see that it's so obvious to everybody who reads it and it's just it feels i, I don't know i i remember seeing that uh, er, also in 2016 and that, that was the days i was at cnn starting to see it more and more and it uh, you know it starts from the, the places that you can you can't even fault for doing this because that's their business model like salon but i distinctly remember the first time i saw a cnn feature about white women Mm. And I remember thinking again, this was at the heels of me too, thinking this is odd. This is. Yeah. The compartmentalizing people in this way. Right. And categorizing like it, we, we just never really did that before. It's uh, gerrymandering who you're allowed to hate. Right. Who you are allowed to blame for the, mm. the, the calamity that is Trump. Yeah. No, it's funny. Cause I did, I, I did see this kind of, uh, shaping type behavior a lot with, um, you know, campaign journalism where, you know, you'd literally be on the plane and the re- reporters would be talking about, uh, essentially, essentially in code in their stories about which candidates you're allowed to take seriously and which ones you're not allowed to take seriously. Right. And they got really, really good at that to the point where, um, you know, it, People understood before they even heard a candidate speak that Dennis Kucinich was a fringe candidate and, uh, and and Howard Dean was too far left and John Kerry was serious, you know, even <laughs> even though, uh, you know, one act, the, the, the actual message was actually much more interesting in one place than the other. 
but they were constantly telling you like what was appropriate in terms of your level of interest. Mm. Now what we do is they're, is they're constantly shifting in, in terms of letting audiences know what they're allowed to be interested in, what they're allowed to care about, where they're allowed to have empathy, where they're not allowed to have empathy. Um, and they, they change it up so often to me. I think it, it's almost like being in an abusive relationship where the unpredictability <laughs> Seriously, like I mean, I yeah, not yeah. that I can connect with that, but but you know, you you, you the, the it's it changes so often that you're on your guard um, constantly, and and you find people, um, you know, reading the news now is like it can be kind of a stressful experience to kind of keep track of what am I allowed to think today, you know, like or, or what, who am I allowed to talk to today? It's it's uh, it's it's you know, crazy. I no, I, 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 I see your, your hyperbolic analogy and I'll, I'll, I'll raise <laughs> it. raise me? <laughs> Hannah Arendt. So weird that I keep pronouncing it in the Hebrew. Hannah, because Han, Hannah, whatever. <laughs> <She's> like Hala. <laughs> <laughs> One of my, my favorite um, little points that she made in uh, the origins of totalitarianism is that the common perception of a totalitarian regime is this organized hierarchical system. Everybody knows their place. It's extremely strict. There's no mobility. But the truth is, she points out, is that these are by design fundamentally chaotic, that there is intentional chaos that is meant to keep everybody on, on their toes, that is meant to keep everyone guessing. Hmm. You know what the center is, but around it, it's just an orbit of uncertainty. You don't know who's in the inner circle. Who can you trust? Who can't you trust? What are you allowed to say and what you're not? And the rules seem to be constantly shifting and changing because the truth is there are no rules. Mm. And whether in an abusive relationship or in a totalitarian regime or in, you know, even in just a really toxic office environment, this chaotic arbitrariness just keeps you afraid to make a move to step out and, and express yourself because you just don't know how everything might change around you tomorrow. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I and I, I met people in in Russia who recounted their experiences in, in the Soviet Union, and they would tell you exactly the same story. Where you know you'd have one person who would be blatantly defying authority and would just get away with it for a long time, and there would be no explanation. There'd be mm. a, somebody else who'd be a, a good a good party member their whole lives. They would slip once, and they'd be like, like taken away in the in the bread truck the next day, right? Um, the, the inconsistency of, of how Soviet justice was administered and kind of the randomness of it uh, was part of what made it so terrifying. And, um, and it was, so, it was really effective. Like, you know, the, the, the Russians were, you know, I would say not, um, they probably wouldn't have been able to to build like the perfect Orwellian state if they wanted to, but they were really, really good at creating high levels of uh, terror in the population, mm. among other things through 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 these like weird psychological techniques that. Uh, and I, I don't mean to compare that. Right, to, right. No, to, of course. But but there there is something there. Right, and to to, to bring it back and hopefully land the <laughs> hyperbole plane a little bit. Something that was really interesting when, um, and this is obviously a period that you were covering uh, uh, personally, so I don't need to tell you, but um, <laughs> when Putin took over after Yeltsin, and Yeltsin was the, the brief moment that Russia pseudo experimented with democracy, right? And democracy. like a good democracy enjoyed the, the rise of <laughs> oligarchy and, and um, uh, cronyism. For those who couldn't see, Matt put democracy in air quotes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I think I conveyed it with my tone. But um, <laughs> but, but when Putin um, came into office, no a memo was sent to the media that you know now we are hmm. a kleptocratic autocracy, and you need to fall in line. And Vladimir Putin will be approving your messages from now on. They just understood. They understood that this right. is how things are going to work from now on. He's in charge now. And newspapers that yesterday were writing hit pieces against Putin just stopped. Right. And instead began publishing glowing profiles of the man. <laughs> and he didn't need to kill anyone, didn't need to arrest anyone. Hmm. It, it was just so clear. You knew how the system worked. And I, it's fascinating. So 
to bring it back and obviously not the same uh, with a million caveats, but still to bring it up to the way that we, we understand how power works in our environment. And most people almost, I guess it's almost a personality thing, whether you, you, you decide to play along with it or whether the very recognition that such conformity is expected of you makes you antagonistic, makes you want to defy it. There was something in the U.S. around that time from 2015 onwards that, that really noticed this change in language, in, in the way we cover things, the way we are thinking about things, the way we frame our stories, that you know, nobody issued a memo. Right. I wonder if you have a, a theory of what caused it and, and how did it get so quickly absorbed? That's a really good question because it was almost instantaneous. Like it, mm -hmm. there, it was like a moment in time that, that it happened. You know, I, I, I like to point to the, to the August 2016 editorial by Jim Rutenberg mm -hmm. um, in the New York Times that it was entitled, uh, Trump is testing the norms of, object, of objectivity in journalism. And he talked about changing the standard from being true to being true to history's judgment. <laughs> and uh, it was like from that moment forward, we suddenly had like advocacy media and there were all these rules. And, um, uh, I, you know, obviously I, I had had a lot of conversations with, with reporters leading up to that time. I know I know it was on the minds of people that that maybe they were thinking about changing the way they would do business. Um, but then uh, it feels like the moment they announced it, like the, 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 the Times came out with that editorial, suddenly everybody decided like en masse, you know, it's in the same way that like, uh, you know, once 50% of a herd of deer decide to run one way, like they all do, um, <laughs> you know, it, it just happened in a flash. Suddenly we had that media landscape you were talking about and we just, it just hasn't, you know, gone back uh, since. Mm -hmm. So it is, it certainly has something to do with Trump, but why exactly then? And, and why we've continued to, 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 to keep it? I'm not sure. So this is something mm -hmm. Vanessa and I were just talking about in, in preparing for this actually, and whether or not Trump is really, you know, the cause or just a catalyst Right. for me, it seems that if anything, we were just marching there because of, changing business incentives in the way that media gets its cues b both for you know just literally how to to raise revenue but also who are the voices that guide the editorial direction which is you have social media you have you have a sense of mass a massive like vox populi but it's not really a vox populi you know it's vox elite populi that, that, mm. that sends the signals of where, where, where you, you, you do coverage and where you're not allowed to have coverage. And that's just, you know, the, the wisdom of the masses, or again, the overeducated masses charting a new editorial direction. But as long as there wasn't an emergency, the crusty skin of, of old media was still allowed to stay on while mm. things were changing underneath. Trump was such a dramatic uh, test for that, that, that the, the old mold was not allowed to stay anymore and, and it just cracked or shed off. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting question, right? It's sort of a chicken and the egg thing. My, I, my theory on that, and I have thought about that exact question that you're asking, um, have, cause, because I had covered uh, presidential elections uh, four times before Trump, um, I had spent a ton of time, like way too much time thinking about that process of, mm -hmm. um, of journalists deciding who gets to be the nominee and who doesn't and how, how invested they were in that. Right. And then here came, it, it, Trump came along and just blew that all up. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, they openly denounced him as not only unsuitable or fringe, but like, you know, a cross between Hitler and, you know, Charlie Manson or whatever it was. And like that actually gave him a bump in the polls, right? So um, I, I think that that triggered kind of a psychotic break in the <laughs> business because, because they were so accustomed to having so much power or like, uh, you know, get, so much of that gatekeeping authority. Um, and I know that's a cliche term, but I think, it, I think there's something to it. Uh, but they lost it, you know, in that moment. Um, now they still have it. On the Democratic side, I think you saw it, that it was very powerfully exercised 
in 2020, you know, there was that intense campaign um, against Sanders that ranged, every, you know, from everything from identifying him as Putin's favorite to the Elizabeth Warren story to all that stuff. And they, and they, you know, he, he was successfully stamped out in the end. So they feel like they still have some control over a segment of the population. And I think that's, I think that's why you see these behaviors being amped up so much. It's because they lost it in terms of half of the population, at least. <laughs> um, and so they're, they're trying to cling to, to, to some influence. So is, is you're saying is that it's, it's kind of a midlife crisis for <laughs> yeah, liberal yeah, journalists? Exactly. Like they're realizing that they're impotent, um, <laughs> they're losing hair, and totally. now, now, now they need to get their new red convertible Lamborghini. Do Lamborghinis come in convertible? I don't know. <laughs> and huh. I guess the form that it took is, you know, all the uh, pathos of democracy dies in darkness. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw... Uh, there is a recent New York Times ad that targeted me for some reason on, on YouTube that was, like, I think, one of the, the, the most uh, shocking things I've ever seen. I love it already, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> it just shows um, really, I think, awfully selected uh, close ups of, um, of camera phone footage. And it says journalism needs a human. Journalism needs. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Truth needs a human. Truth needs a journalist. And then it says truth. A human by journalist. <laughs> <laughs> Not pompous at all, right? <laughs> yeah, it's something. <laughs> oh, the, the overcompensation of it. Now that's that's driving six Lamborghinis at once. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, in your metaphor. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, no, that, yeah, that, that's, that is something totally like that. overcompensating. Yeah, yeah. No, you're 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 absolutely right. It's it's they they lost their fastball and they they don't have enough, you know, to, to and and you're you're right. So they're they're overcompensating with with behaviors that are worse. Um, I, I would also say that by their own standards, worse by their own traditional standards, call it, which I think is the reason that we find it so frustrating because we genuinely care about some of these values. But yeah, they're they're violating everything that they used to value, but but even worse than that, I think is the, the and this is the element that 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 I find the most baffling, which is that a big part of the reason that Trump happened was hatred of the media. Right. Uh and and dis, and distrust of the media. And so they they had actually actively caused their own disenfranchisement and rather than examine that and come face to face with that, like, you know, if, if we're going to make this a metaphor um, and make it like a midlife crisis, you know, sometimes you bring about your own problems and in, in order to fix them, you got to look hard in the mirror and, and make some changes. Well, they, they didn't do that. They, they, you know, they did the other thing <laughs> and, um, and, and, and they're, and they're now they're, now the problem is compounded, right? So everything, everything you thought that would be this, the, the solution is actually just is 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 just enhancing that same dynamic that that got you um, miserable in the first place. But they have more <laughs> newsletters now. That'll fix it. Yeah. Well, well <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I I was talking to somebody at the Times a couple of weeks ago who was telling me like the editorial page editors at the Times are terrified of of Substack. Right. And, oh, oh, before I even let you go where you're going with yeah. this. <laughs> I remember when I first read their announcement that they were going to be pivoting towards more newsletters. That was, that's so weird. You think the reason people are moving to Substack is because it's a newsletter? You think that it's the format that is driving your audience away? Wow. I mean, and again, the New York Times is fine. They're not really hemorrhaging. They're good. But obviously, the Washington Post is also starting a newsletter. So it's clearly some sort of conventional wisdom that's being formed. Between Axios and Substack, they feel clearly, clearly the, fu the future is newsletters. Well, right. And you start to think to yourself, what adult would go through that thought process and think, well, oh, in order, in order to compete financially with Substack, not that we need to, um, you know, not that that's even a necessity. Like, it's, it's weird that they think they have to. But like, let's let's do it just by creating a newsletter. Like, who doesn't see that the whole like 
reason that people go to Substack is because it's not, it does not have the imprimatur of, of, the, of the New York Times. Like definitionally, it is the news that does not fit for print. Exactly, exactly. Like you, you, you just by definition, you you can't do it. It, it won't work, right? Uh, and what would work though, uh, if they if they were being, you know, honest about it, would just be doing what they do better. You know, right. like not not screwing up Caliphate, but but <laughs> but actually making a, a really interesting, well-reported podcast about the Middle East. That's how they win. You know, they've they've got they've got buttloads of money. They they can do that stuff, um, but they just can't seem to get out of their own way. And 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 yeah, the story that you're telling is is is, is really is really interesting that just the, the level of cluelessness is kind of is, is kind of awesome but not letting you off the hook what was your story about the newsletters oh yeah no, no they just they, they were just telling me you know that, that they're that they're terrified of substack and i and it's just it's just the same all the same stuff we were just talking about i found that i, I found it amazing because they must recognize i mean there must be some people on on the staff who know what the issue is right <laughs> and um you know, for, for them not to be able to reckon with the problem on a real level is, well, I mean, it's just, it reminds me of like what happened after Trump got elected. You remember there were, there was all this talk about how, oh, the New York Times, you know, we, we hunkered down, we had these big meetings, to try to figure out how it was that we missed this story. Like, mm. you know, how do we have the world's largest news organization and not be clued into this, this movement that's happening literally you know, everywhere in America, that's, you know, a mile outside of a big city. And their response was like, let's, let's hire Brett Stevens or something like that. Right. <laughs> like they, they, they didn't, they, they, they couldn't bring themselves to have a real response to that, to that problem. We'll expand our, our viewpoint diversity by adding the anti-Trump semi-Republican. Right. Exactly. Bushite like, Republican. The, a grown up thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> That, that I, shit is funny. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's, uh, I mean, one thing we haven't touched on at all, which I do think we, we should probably bring into the conversation, is the role of the tech platforms. Like, surely that is also playing, like, the algorithms are playing a role. The, the fact that the New York Times is tracking your emotions in order to <laughs> target the right content to you uh, as, a, as a newsletter or as a New York Times subscriber. Like, I don't know if we would call it a an accelerant, uh, but I, I don't know. I'm inclined to think it's more than just an accelerant. Like the, the fact that the way that you consume the media is mediated through tech platforms, I definitely think is. You're saying that it. it you're saying that it's eating the brain cells of the people who work at the Times. That, <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm saying that it's. Well, I think it's 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 directing the way that the media goes. Like this is like one of the huge factors. It's like the ways that we are, we, we're demanding it. It's on our feeds, the, the algorithms are feeding it to us. And, and it's like, it's creating this, this feedback loop. Or, or, or it worked exactly the way it's supposed to. And it, it creates profits for all these companies. Um, and the Times has given itself over to the audience optimization model in the same way that Fox did 20 years ago or 25 years ago. Mm. And the result, you know, is politically nuts. Um, but I think it works for Facebook. It works for Google. It works for, you know, what's what's different is, well, first of all, there's there's a whole lot to unpack when we talk and talk. We want to talk about the role of the tech companies and media. The first thing is that they they were incredibly slow to realize that they would never be able to compete with the advertising. Like the, there was a delusion that persisted in the business for mm -hmm. um, decades that we, we would still be able to make money the way we used to and not realizing that just by definition, Facebook and Google with all the data they collected would just be, their advertising would be much more effective and they would lose all their, all their advertising to these companies, which is exactly what happened. Right. So they they were dumb about that. They didn't adapt. When they finally did adapt, the only thing they could think to do um, was to create this new model that was based on exactly what you were talking about, Vanessa. Which is let's let's try to amp up the emotional level of our mm -hmm. uh, audiences. Let's cr let's create an emotional addiction 
to our product. But in order to do that, we have to create a content. Uh, we, have to, we have to create content that's essentially like, um, you know, a, a sports-like phenomenon, right? Where we're, we're creating crowds of rooters uh, who, you know, want to all feel the same thing or come to mass together. It's not it's not the same product that the news used to be, which is, you know, sort of dispassionate um, thing that triggered your curiosity, maybe, or or was had had utility. Like they gave they gave up on the utility model and they went for this right. emotional model, and um, and th- that may have, that may work in the short term, but in the long term, it's just, <laughs> it, it it doesn't work when you're trying to sell credibility, right? Uh, because uh, it, you know, people will recognize pretty quickly that what you're doing is not really reporting. It's, it's something else. It's emotional manipulation. And, and um, I, I think, I think it's going to have a, a negative effect on the business. Well, it already has. Yeah. So broad question for conclusion, when you're surveying the different forces that are acting on the media landscape right now, the cultural, the political, the social, the financial, which do you consider the most dominant trend right now and how relevant is it going to be in 2024 when republicans stage a coup uh well i what i would say is that i i I think the only thing i would say is that i think that legacy media is basically already like dead like i i I think Hmm. even though it's still you know seems to be exerting a lot of influence out there in in America, it's it's already disgraced and losing, uh, sort of rapidly losing um, any vestige of the leftover uh, respect that it once had. And what that means to me is that something is going to rise in its mm. place. Like those institutions will continue to exist, but something is going to come up. You know, and it's not going to be Substack, or it's not going to be my Substack anyway, right? But something it'll, it'll, centralized. It'll, Something sense, yes. Yeah, somebody is going to come up with a with a uh, a credible, uh, popular uh, product that is going to be a place where people get information, mm. and and that is, I don't know when that's going to happen, but it's going it, it is going to happen uh, eventually, uh, and and it may be an amalgam of like thousands of sites. You know, like who knows, right? Like like the technology is changing so quickly now that like it, it could be. Could be anything that will happen, but I do know that this the the a lot of the dynamics that I wrote about in Hate Inc. are going to be irrelevant pretty soon, because these companies are no longer going to be anywhere near as powerful as they were, and you know how that's going to affect 2016. I I just think that they're right 2024. now. 2024. 20. I'm sorry. 2024. Right. Right now, there's this there's this like wellspring of rage towards the main the. the "Quote unquote mainstream media that drives people to a lot of these decisions, but I think I think that's actually going to start waning because hmm. because people are going to see the media as being pathetic, or pathetic, you know, soon. Like I, it, it, we're not there yet, but I think that's going to happen. Like people, hmm. and and you're not worried about um, too much decentralization. Oh, I am definitely. I mean, I you know, I, I've I have friends who worked in. Yugoslavia in the in the early '90s and good times, you know, and uh, yeah, exactly. And so I do worry about the whole sort of balkanization thing. And this is a this is a heavily armed, confused, angry country that is has is rapidly losing faith in all of its institutions. Um, you know, the, the the few that hold respect still, like the the military. Um, you know, don't really play central roles in, in shaping American culture. So, uh, yeah, I worry a lot. Like the media should have a big role in this moment, but it, it can't because it's become it's become a focus of political attention, negative political attention. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm extremely worried about that for sure. So the final question is, and this is just our, our standard, and I actually would want to hear your answer to it. What would you say? And I don't just mean in context of media or politics that we talk about, but also on a, on a human absurdist level. What are the biggest blind spots on the left and on the right? 
So on the left, I think it's pretty clearly the lag, the inability to see that they're aristocrats. Um, hmm. it, it, you know, I, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about a certain segment of, I guess it's not really the real left. It's, it's the, it's the kind of MSNBC left, right. That I'm right. talking about, but the, the, the inability to see that, you know, they belong to the upper classes that they, that they are the 1% or the, or that they're in the top 10%. Um, that's, <laughs> that's kind of amazing to me. Like I, it's I, like I, the astronaut meme. Wait, we are the 1%? You always were. Yeah. I, I, remember, I remember talking to reporters in the, in the press corps as we covered Trump, and he was constantly talking about how we were the enemy of the people and trying to get people to throw shit at us and stuff. And and I remember, you know, watching people, and they're, and they're dressed in, you know, $800 blazers, and, uh, and they have beautiful, you know, Cordovan shoes on, and they're saying, like, well, why are people mad at us? What do, what do we do? What do we have anything to do with it? You know, like they, they don't get that they're a representative of like they're a symbol of like the hated people up on the Olympus. They, they mm. just have no ability to see that. And it's it's uh, always shocking to me on the right. You know, that's interesting because the the there's there's two different things we're talking about. There's there are, there's right wing politicians and then there's the people who are actually make up their voters. And I think that those are two different groups. For right-wing politicians, the inability to see, to distinguish between, a, you know, a, a real communist and what they consider a communist <laughs> is always fascinating to me. Like, like you know, they, they you will meet people who will, who will believe that, you know, seriously think that Sesame Street is a communist show, mm. you know? Um, they don't... They, and they're they're just the, the sort of total inability to diagnose what's happening uh, economically in the country or why uh, they're they're just so reliant on these old cliches that maybe were last relevant in, in the '60s. That's always interesting to me. Uh, but the you know as for as for yeah the, the other thing is their is their inability to capitalize on political opportunity. You know you keep having situations where Democrats, it's almost like they want to give votes away. You know, they they, they 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 come up with schemes that are like designed to be unpopular. Like let's let's defund the police com completely uh, in the middle of a crime wave or or whatever it is, right? Or um, or, or they'll come up with some weird niche uh, cause that a really most people cause. Hate. Yeah, exactly. And the Republicans will come back with an idea that's worse somehow, right? Like, you know, let's let's ban, um, you know, by state law, all thinking along path X, you know what I mean? Which is a total violation. Like, all they would have to do is do nothing, like. <laughs> and, and you know, the, the, the critical race theory discourse is actually a great example because the way that some people on the extreme left used it as, a, as an excuse to promote illiberal views was a perfect opening for Republicans to then say, ha, look at the, that bottlerizing movement that is trying to ban Harper Lee and rewrite history and take down Thomas Jefferson. But instead of committing to this position of open discourse, Republicans decided to double down on censorship and say, no, we will ban your books. And you know what? We'll also ban Harper Lee. Right, right, right. It's like the only th it's like, I don't know if you watch sports, but like, Sometimes there'll be a situation where the ESPN has a feature now where it tells you the percentage chance of your team to win at the end of a game. So, you know, like the Packers will be up 31 to seven with 30, 34 seconds left in the game. And it'll say, you know, 99.8, whatever. There's, like, there's only like two things you could possibly do to, 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 to win the game. Uh, or to lose that game. And the Republicans figure that out every time. Like they figure out that 0.2% in every political situation like how, how how do you how do you miss the opportunity politically to capitalize on something like critical race theory like they find a way you know i mean like that, that, that. jonah goldberg has this refrain in his columns that both parties are uh, just seem to be committed to being a minority party <laughs> that's really funny that's true it's true <laughs> Matt Davey, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Maybe we'll get to the second question next time. Yeah, yeah sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good, night. Good night. Take care now. 
Thank you for listening to Uncertain Things. Follow us on uncertain.substack.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and share us with your friends and enemies. We'll see you next time. Stay safe.